All right, welcome everyone. My name is Marilyn Rakel. I'm the Executive Director of MODS Awards for Innovation in Alzheimer's Care, and it is a thrill to welcome you to the announcement of the awardees for our fifth anniversary. Um, and to begin, we are going to hear a short video from our wonderful founder, Richard Ferry. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today to celebrate 2024 winners for Moz Awards. We are meeting virtually at the Memory and Brain Wellness Center's Memory Hub, a place that enthusiastically supports the dementia-friendly community in a collaborative and impactful way while advancing a new movement for dementia care in this country. We are hosted today by the remarkable Mary Grace Becker, the Executive Director of the Hub, who is managing the technical aspects of the meeting. Mary Grace, thank you. We are honored to be guided by the Hub for the awards presentation. Let me share a bit of historical perspective before introducing the awards program. Regrettably, the medical community has not found a cure for Alzheimer's and related dementias. The number of persons living with the illness is vast and growing. Currently, 6.9 million age 65 and older have the disease, with 13.8 million projected by 2050. The total cost is equally daunting. Estimated to exceed 360 billion this year alone, and the cost over the next 26 years is projected to reach $1 trillion. In addition, care partners and family members contribute an estimated $350 billion in unpaid costs annually, with 60% of the care partners experiencing extremely high stress along with their financial challenges. With this as background, we ask the $64,000 question, when can we expect a cure? The answer is simply, we don't know. While we are waiting a cure, quality and availability of care has become paramount. How can we provide care that will support and enhance the quality of life for the many millions living with Alzheimer's, along with their families and care partners? Five years ago, I decided to launch Maud's Awards in honor of my beloved wife, Maud, who passed away on Labor Day 2021, only three years ago to help find the care while we are waiting for the cure. Maude was a matriarch extraordinaire, a community advocate and a philanthropist, who had a long and lasting gift of love for all those who walked in her path. She was a devoted wife of 65 years, my global business partner, my best friend, my global golfing partner, the mother of six wonderful children, and the grandmother and great-grandmother of 16 and soon to be 17 adorable grandkids. She lived her life with grace and elegance and was a strong role model for all who knew her. I've often described her as the wind beneath my wings. In Ma's final years, while she lived with dementia, my life was dedicated to her and to finding ways to engage and comfort her during her illness. The awards program is a realization of my prayers and dreams to enhance Ma's life and the lives of those living with dementia came to being as a result of my constant search to discover new and innovative concepts and programs to benefit the dementia population in combination with the hiring of a very accomplished and talented executive director, Marilyn Rakel, who herself was a care partner for her mother and father, and the author of a recently published and soon to be bestseller, <laughs> Don't Walk Away, Care Partner's Journey. It's a joyful, hopeful account of a mother and father mother and daughter's life with Alzheimer's. Since its founding five years ago, as I mentioned, Moz Awards has focused on care while we're waiting for the cure. Each year we are thrilled with the discovery of a wide range of new ideas and practices and programs to present to the dementia community. This year we received a record number of applications and we are so grateful to the number of individuals and organizations who are willing to share their vision and knowledge for the health and well-being of all those who are struggling with dementia, along with their family and care partners. With this information, we are delighted to publish an annual handbook to benefit the dementia community 
2024 book will be available on the Mods Awards website in November of this year. Let me close with a thank you to our 2024 applicants for sharing their ideas and innovations, to our very extraordinary Executive Director, Marilyn Rakel, to our dedicated advisory board members, Mary Grace Becker, Jim Bennett, Dr. Lee Burnside, Brian Osborne, Karen Mack, and Allison Schreier, who evaluate and score the applications, and to the Foundation Board, who generously provides the funding for the monetary awards. My sincere congratulations to the 2024 Mods Award winners. God bless you, and thank you for joining us today to share your winning story. I will turn the meeting over to Malroom to announce the seven winners. Thank you, Richard. And um, now I am going to thank Mary Grace Becker and introduce her. My gratitude to this woman knows no bounds. Mary Grace. Thank you so much, Marilyn, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for that kind introduction, Marilyn and Richard. Um, my name is Mary Grace Becker, and I'm on the board. It's my privilege to be on the board of Mons Awards, and I'm the director of the Memory Hub here in Seattle, Washington. The Memory Hub is a dynamic community center offering a variety of programs and resources for people with memory loss, their families, and all who support a dementia-friendly community. Operated by the UW or University of Washington Memory and Brain Wellness Center and bringing collaborating organizations under one roof, our aim is to redefine life with memory loss. We just opened two and a half years ago, and you can learn more on our website, www.thememoryhub.org. We're so pleased to host this virtual Mods Awards reception today in honor of the many innovators across the country. Thank you, Mary Grace. And now it is my pleasure to begin to introduce our awardees. And I am going to begin in the category of making connections, which is creating meaningful opportunities for people living with dementia to connect to the people and the world around them. And I'm going to begin with Arlita Hall, who is the uh, creator of Finding Your Laughter. Arlita. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Chicago. Yes, I am <laughs> Arlita Hall. <laughs> I am a caregiver for my father, who was, a person, who was a person with Alzheimer's, and I am a current caregiver for my mom, who was a person with early onset dementia, and also a care pair caregiver for my stepfather, who was a person with dementia and bipolar. So um, I came into this because my father was diagnosed first and I wanted to make sure that he remembered me and had so much fun on his way out. So I was a caseworker for the state of Illinois. I quit my job, decided I was gonna come take care of my dad with my stepmom who, who recently had just took care of her mother with Alzheimer's. So her and my dad took care of him on their way out. So I'm like, boom, you need my help. You can't do this by yourself. So I'm like, I wanna laugh with my dick. So I came over here and at the same time I was taking improv classes and realized, Boom, this is the same thing. This is just like my scene. This is just like my scene partners. I don't know what they're going to say, but I have to agree with it. So we have a show. So I would do the same thing with my father, even though my hair is nice and long today. Boom, it's really not in real life. I have like the same Afro as Lori Lightfoot. That was the mayor of Chicago, which is a little boy. So my dad always thought I was a little boy running around the house. He'd be like, young man. I'd be like, yes, sir. So he thought I had Alzheimer's. So I decided that I would take videos of us and put them online. And as I was doing that, people would love them and say that what you and your dad are doing is great. I would engage him with dancing a lot. My dad is from Chicago. He knew how to step into his last days of living. So I put them online. People loved them. And I started to make a documentary. The documentary is called Finding Your Laughter. Is it about me? That's a stand-up comedian that shares my story with everyone on stage about how comedy changed my life and how improv helped me to take care of my father, which led me to making my workshop, which is an intro for caregiving workshop, where I teach people how to use improv with people that have dementia and Alzheimer's and how to use empathy as a light switch. Cause you know, some people say, I don't have that. Yes, you do right now for two seconds. Yes, you do. And then I also teach them how to story tell in the moment. Sometimes as caregivers, it is a lot going on and we need to be able to take what's happening to us, be able to embrace it, break it down, understand it, and then attach a different emotion to it so we don't care to take all that on with us. 
So I am hopefully going to be done with my documentary by the end of this year. I am so thankful for this Mods Awards. Um, like I said, I found purpose in my life with dementia and Alzheimer's. Did not know that that was going to be a thing. Um, I watched my grandmother with it at seven. I was like, oh, this is not going to be okay. But now it is how I live my life. Look around in a room. Oh, yeah, we all age and we all get confused. So that is my thing. That's why I'm here. So hopefully in this chat today, I will be able to connect with other people. I do. I teach this workshop online and I actually have a small clip of my workshop today to show you all to show how it looks like. I was able to do one here on the south side of Chicago with um, teenagers starting at 18 all the way up till <laughs> it don't matter how old they are. <laughs> but we did it together to kind of just show that it's something that we all have to do and get prepared to take care of each other. So I have provided a short clip of that. And also, if you all please, please follow my website, www.findingyourlaughter.com. You all can watch my trailer where you will see me hands-on taking care of my daddy who I miss <laughs> and also will see some of those tools and be able to stay involved till the film comes out. Um, I not only want to make a film that I'm looking to put on like PBS, like I want it to be like able that we can all let stream it, but I am also making it like a 15 minute educational cut so that we can like put it in different facilities and like work in different medical facilities and different educational um, institutions. So that way we can have a different way of caregiving for people. I'm so tired of seeing Alzheimer's and dementia commercials with people looking so sad when, as you all know, we take care of these people. They have a lot of life. They have a lot of joy. And I really want to show that and really show how comedy is something that we all need to kind of get through this little crazy thing we live in called life. So that is my spiel. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my video. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. <laughs> is it something that I need to push? Just wanted to make sure. No, I think it's Mary Grace. Oh. I did not have a video pulled up or Lita. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I could keep talking. So my father passed away in 2022. And as we all know, that's not the end of the journey. As caregivers, you still live in that like real room of where they're going to be and what it, what is really happening. So we included that in the documentary, getting through those stages of grief and how that feels and what that looks like. And it has also been a journey for me. Like, you know, we all know that my dad was the first person in my, first, in my family to be cremated. And we all know the difference between cremation and burial, right? $15,000. I was like, add flowers in the back. <laughs> so it has just been a complete journey of, like I said, finding my laughter with my father and sharing it. And then sharing some of the stories that like, you'll see in the trailer. Um, these are things that I actually used to really cry about. It was very hard for me to deal with my dad wandering from me. It was very hard for me to deal with him not knowing who I was. And then when I would tell like my mother and my stepmom and they thought it was funny, I was like, oh, wow, we actually got something going on. And then people will come up to me after shows and be like, I'm dealing with this, I'm dealing with that, with my aunt, my grandmother, my friend, my friend's mother is this. So I realized that Alzheimer's and dementia is something that we all have a connection to, no matter the ethnicity, no matter like what we look like, no matter who we are. So it has just really taught me how to deal with people in everyday life and have more patience. And um, I'm just very... I'm thankful to be here. Like I said, um, I never knew that at the uh, tender age of 35 that Alzheimer's and dementia would be the um, way in who I love to live and how I enjoy. I just literally was in the Alzheimer's unit yesterday trying to make them laugh. I'm like, it's okay. I don't care. Let's say that story again. Let's talk about it again. So um, <laughs> that's just what I encourage. And um, I just thank you all for um, being you. Thank you all for these beautiful comments. It, it means a lot to me um, to be able to do this kind of thing. So I hope you all can see what really in my trailer and stuff, why I'm this crazy and pumped up about Alzheimer's. I know y'all ain't never seen it before, but baby, it's a Thank treat. You. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arlita. No um, okay, and we're sorry about the, the video, but but we'll make sure people know it. Uh, we'll send, I'll send it out. If I get the link, yeah. I'll send it out to everybody. Okay. So next we are going to hear from Teresa Montgomery, who is the creator of a podcast called Let's Talk About It, Walking the Talk for Dementia. Teresa. 
Turn myself on. Hello, everybody. This is very exciting to be here. First, I want to just give out thanks for having that opportunity to be here and for the purpose and the memory of the Mod uh, Ward. Um, so, being um, someone that's living with this disease, and that's me, yours truly. And so, in doing that, um, when you want to make that connection, just because you have dementia doesn't mean that we sit still. It doesn't mean that we are overlooked. We're trying to break that stigma of people that is like us. We look normal. Most people can't tell if we have it or we don't have it. They look at you and they're like, you don't have that disease. But the most important thing of having like, let's talk about it, is to be out into the community and tell everybody, hey, Let's talk about that. Do you know about clinical trials? When was the last time you went to the doctor? When was the last time that you went into the event? Why are you standing in the background? Why don't you come to the front of the building? Why don't you tell us and share? Why don't you stop being isolated? So we make it so that when you get that news, and sometimes you may not, it depends upon how someone tells you what you have. And then what do you do with that? Most of us back up and says, oh, wow, whoa, it's me, it's terminal. No, you don't even think like that because they are working on something uh, for a cure. But in, in doing that, you don't have time but to go on and participate and learn more about clinical trials. We need that kind of invol involvement. And then the most best part about it is when you could talk, when you can join other groups, when you can advocate, when you don't like what's going on, we have that voice. And so part of let's talking about it and what walking the talk for dementia is for to get people that have it to do just that. Make sure that you are recognized. Make sure that you don't feel like I'm unworthy. Make sure that you have hope. Make sure that you participate in some organization. And if you don't have one, then create. Be as creative as what we've just seen with our leader. And so the, the beauty of it all is, is to have hope is to continue to make your connections with people. It's continue to make your connections doing what you want to do. I had Juanita, which was a puppet, okay? And so in doing that, you want to make sure that you can reach out across the board to your doctors. You want to reach out to your professors, your universities. And when they give you a diagnosis, you want to make sure that they understand that I'm living. Don't slow down when you're talking to me. Talk to me normal, and then don't be afraid to come on board and do whatever it is that you want to do. As far as your health and making sure that you go to the doctors on time, make sure you're doing whatever that you need to do. But most importantly, live a life that you love to live. Explore things you've never done before. Be as courageous as a warrior ever could be. And most important, I want to tell you two things. Yes, yes, Y-A-S-S, -S, is one, you are someone special. And two, you are someone, you are a shining star. And with that, I'm going to end it so I don't go too far and just be so appreciative to be able to be here today and receive this award for many others to feel worthy. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much, Teresa. We have a short PowerPoint and also video submitted on your behalf as well. Um, would you like to show the PowerPoint and the video or just the video? Um, you can show them both if you want as to what the okay. point is. Great, I'll bring them up, <laughs> perfect. So as you see, um, as far as the podcast goes and, and meeting people from everywhere, all across the country, we're in 7,000 um, different, um, from the countries around the world globally that is living with dementia. And we make it an exciting event. Um, in regards to, we already did the introduction. Um, let's talk about it, what it is. 
And the power of communication to not be afraid or turn over anyone, no matter who you may be. We want to talk to you. We want you to feel valuable. And all the many organizations that's out there. Um, our goal is to break the stigma for people to opinionate and think that we don't understand. And redefining dementia, dementia, yes, it's a disease, but it is not chains. It is something that you have to go through life. And there are some people that has been successfully got through it. And advocating is to be into the know and to say your opinion and go out there and rally and tell your story and fight for what you want for fair treatment. He's uh, in walking the talk for dementia is giving people the opportunity to go all across into a different country, which this was Spain. Um, and so that right there is we want to join forces together around the world because we all have dementia um, in places globally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, and then we have a short that, video also. Oh, just one second. I think it's only 60 seconds. Yeah, it's real quick. Don't want to miss it. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you so very much, um, everyone. And now joining us is Kristen Niels Nelson with the Audivi Memory Banks. Kristen. Hi, and thank you so much for this award and honor and the opportunity to meet all of you and share something about Audivi Memory Banks. Um, Mary Grace, can I share? Go for it. Great. This is my mom. Like others, I started Audubon Memory Banks based on my experience as a caregiver for her when she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, like many others, she had no short-term memory, but she had really vivid long-term memories that she repeated all the time. It can be difficult as a caregiver to hear those stories again and again, but I came to realize that she really liked them. She liked telling them and she liked hearing them. I actually stumbled into this by accident. I recorded these audio memories more for us than for her so that we would have them uh, and then put them on a website with a photo and happened to play it back for her. And that was the birth of Audubon. I have a very short video, which just shows her enjoying a single memory. It's a photo plus uh, her voice telling the memory on three separate occasions. Maybe hard to hear it, but I think if you watch her gesticulations and her enjoyment, you'll get a sense of what Audubon Memory Banks is trying to do. Yeah. And you took your roommate's hand yeah. and you went just up to the door and then you went down like that. Can you imagine something like that? And then you went down like that. Unbelievable. Can you imagine? Like a curtain. Oh, there are roommates. And you took your roommate's hand and you went just up to the door and then you went down like that. Can you imagine something like that? And then you went down like that. Like a curtain. Oh, there are roommates. And you took your roommate's hand and then you went down like that. Can you imagine? Like a curtain. Oh, there are roommates. And then you went to your table. And of course, the table was worse. And because of her profound short-term memory loss, every time she saw it, it brought her joy anew. And she it was like she'd never seen it before. And it occurred to me that this was this wonderful cornerstone, touchstone to the past, something familiar in a day that was otherwise confusing and reminded her of all that she had done. So it occurred to me, you know, we lose our hearing, we get a hearing aid, we lose our eyesight, we get glasses, we have this massive epidemic of memory loss, and there's no similar crutch 
like a prosthesis to help us through the decline. Something that can, you know, offset the isolation, the loneliness and withdrawal that often happens over the course of the disease, or something that can offset that constellation of symptoms, the anxiety or confusion uh, that affect over 90% of individuals with dementia and are associated with higher rates of morbidity, mortality, hospitalization, and caregiver burnout. That's what a memory bank can do. It can help provide, so it doesn't reverse the short-term memory loss, which is so debilitating, but it can provide a host of benefits to the individual and the caregivers. So for the individual, provides those moments of positivity because you maintain ongoing access to the memories and the benefits of reminiscing over time. Reminiscing has been shown to, you know, improve mood, uh, reduce depression, boost sense of pride, boost heart. It lowers blood pressure, lowers heart rate, improves communication skills, loads of benefits of reminiscing. And by saving memories in a memory bank, we ensure ongoing access to those benefits. So for example, long after my mother could no longer articulate her memories, she could instill enjoy them and the benefits of reminiscing with her memory bank. Now for the caregivers, for me, it provides this amazing engagement tool. So for example, if we find ourselves in the emergency room or if someone's prone to sundowning, play the memory bank, redirect those emotions, spark those benefits of reminiscing. If you have a grandchild visiting, if you have a new caregiver coming on board, play the memory bank, give them that connection, this bridge to connect and laugh and converse, a platform to reduce the isolation or the loneliness or the symptoms of withdrawal. The memory banks themselves, I started doing about five years ago, although we've just, just launched this digital health um, application about a year ago that makes it accessible for everybody. Anybody can download Audivy in the Apple or the Google Play Store. Um, this The platform is really focused on how do we keep those memories accessible for somebody? So, you know, it becomes, my mother couldn't read a book, she couldn't really watch a movie, but Audivy is focused on what is the accessibility platform that will continue to make them accessible. I'm going to play just one memory. Typically, memories are organized in a personalized memory bank that you can make private or share with your whole family or with a community. Um, and then the memories play sequentially, one after the other. I'm going to play one memory, again, just to give you a sense of what this sort of immersive trip down memory lane feels like. My mother had a sister in New York, so they would ship me off to New York every vacation. When I was a kid, they would put me on the train, give the conductor maybe $2, and say, take care of my little girl. And he did. And then I would get off the train and my aunt or uncle would pick me up. <laughs> That's one of the stories that she loved to tell. And her son heard it all the time. And you hear she chuckles at the end of it. She enjoys it too. So our call to action is, is just thinking about this fact that like memory isn't typically lost through a catastrophic event. It's not like a bus accident where all of a sudden your leg is gone. There's typically time. We're given warning, symptoms, a diagnosis. Our dream is to help people take advantage of that time to record this thing that can be with them over the course of the disease progression and can help their caregivers and loved ones as well. Memory banks can be made by the individual themselves at the time of diagnosis. It can be made by a daughter, a son, a spouse, a professional care partner. If you have a new geriatric care manager coming on board during that intake process, you can create a memory bank and have it accessible over time. Finally, it can be done by residential communities. We have a community that's now giving it to new residents at the time of move-in, but they don't need a tote bag or a shower caddy. They need their memory banks. And then they can integrate them into the community activities as well. Our goal is to change the standard of care so that we all have our memory banks with us over time. The last thing I'd say is, you know, we've come to learn that exercise and heart healthy diets are all important for us as we age and we've built out practices for them we have invested in community environments that have exercise programs gyms pools classes every day they have mediterranean diets special menus cooks that are trained in in heart healthy diets we need to do the same for reminiscing it offers those benefits for us as we age with, you know, whether we're cognitively intact or experiencing some decline, reminiscing is healthy. 
our dream is that we can continue to build that out for everybody with a simple, easy to use digital application that we hope folks will start to enjoy and have available for themselves and others. Thank you all. And I look forward to uh, connecting with you afterwards. Thank you so much. Reminds me of my mother. Um, and now we get to meet Susan Schifrin of Arts Philadelphia with Opening Doors to Empathy Through the Arts. Susan. Thank you so much. And I just want to start by thanking Maud's Awards, thanking Richard Ferry um, for his vision in starting Maud's Awards. Um, it's such an honor to be here, particularly hearing the other award winners' stories, which are so powerful. So um, the, the last two, Teresa and Kristen, both shared with us um, the power of the individual, whether that's an individual living with dementia or whether it's a care partner. And that is really what uh, the program I'm going to share with you today is about. So as, as Marilyn said, um, we have a program that is called Arts at Jefferson, Opening Doors to Empathy Through the Arts. And, and hopefully it's gonna advance. Wouldn't that be nice? There we go. So um, this is a, a mentoring program in which future healthcare professionals are mentored by people living with dementia, and care partners. And as we say, changing how healthcare works. The model that we're all used to is that healthcare providers have all the answers. And particularly in the case of someone living with dementia or who is a care partner for someone with dementia, we know nothing. This turns that model on its head and the idea is that the mentors in this program are the authorities in the room. They are the only ones who know the ins and outs of lived experiences. Um, there's often some confusion. Well, what exactly do you mean by mentor? And so here are definitions. Our mentors are guides. Our mentors are teachers. They're advisors. Above everything, they are holders of human experience and storytellers about that experience. Um, so how does this work? As I said, our mentors are people living with dementia and current or former care partners. The students who participate in this, and this is a program that's been going on since 2016. Um, we have uh, cited it at several different uh, medical and educational institutions in the greater Philadelphia area. But at Jefferson, we have worked with medical students, pharmacy students, occupational therapy students, nursing and pre-nursing, master's students in public health, physician's assistant students, post-bac students, community trauma counseling students, and other undergraduates and graduate students. And, um, the students who participate in this volunteer for this program, which for them is nine sessions over two months. For mentors, it's seven sessions over two months. Both mentors and students are volunteering their time. And so the impact um, over time, we've had 70 unique mentors who have taught and participated in this program. 90% um, or more have opted to come back again and again to mentor new students. Uh, in the post-course surveys that we've done, 70 to 80% of mentors felt that their interactions with the students added substantively to their quality of life, social engagement, and most importantly, sense of purpose. Close to 100% indicated how much it meant to them to be in a situation where future healthcare providers were hanging on their every word, on their every experience, and 
actively learning by listening to them. Um, and close to 100% have said that doing this program makes them feel they are contributing to a different future. And here are some of our mentors with their students. Impact on students. So uh, around 300 students have taken part in this program since 2016. Um, nearly 100% of the students have indicated that the course has enhanced their ability to listen to others and to value the power of listening. And this is one of our goals, to think very differently about the healthcare provider-patient relationship. 97% uh, of students have noted that the course increased their understanding of the role of empathy in healthcare. And they have developed a more nuanced understanding of how to put empathy into practice. And then finally, many of our students had never even thought about the caregiver burden. And um, both from people living with dementia who were mentoring them and from care partners, they learned what a central issue this is. Here are some of our students. So I can say lots about this program, but I want you to hear directly from a couple of our longtime mentors. Nora and Bill. Then we heard about art through an, a doctor's office who is in a geriatric form and called you. And it was the perfect answer for now. It was the perfect answer for someone with a dementia to be able to speak to medical students or pre-med students or whatever about the trials and tribulations or the anything, anything you wanted to talk about, you were safe. That's that's what it is encouraging to me and I must be to Bill. Oh, absolutely. If, if we didn't have this area, what have we been doing it now? Six, five, six, seven months, something like that. I don't know what I would have done. I mean, dementia is terrible, terrible. But you got it. You got to do something with it. She's been a great help. And Jefferson has been a great help. You guys have been a great help. And uh, what it does, I think, from my perspective, the people who have dementia, and I'm included in that, is you get nervous. Okay. What am I going to do? I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. What should I do now? What should I do? That's, that's almost all eliminated by this type of situation that, that we, you present. So it's helped me tremendously. The first meeting. The first meeting, we had no idea what to expect. None. It, he didn't know he was going to have to draw. I said, I don't know. I hope I don't have to draw because we're out. <laughs> Not drawing. And it was so pleasant to meet in a spot, first of all, that we were comfortable with. We had been there and saw all of these young, beautiful people willing to share that time and the way you organized it all and spoke to everyone's perception of what they were seeing in, to me, it was just a fun place. But all of a sudden, I found out something and I learned something about Bill that he had opinions about these things that we were looking at all this time and said, oh, aren't they funny? Aren't they cute? Aren't they this? And everyone had this particular take on this artist's work. And it was wonderful. It was just magical. And we both came away with a good feeling for that day. And that's so important. It Sometimes it's just moments. 
So that's important. If it, if it lasts longer than a moment, it's gold. I was amazed by her, you know, I thought this, this kid is smart, smart, smart. She never, she never acted that way, but that was my looking at her and saying, because she knew everything I was talking about. And I thought, wow, this is, this is good. This is. So just to end with the voices of our mentors and to say, um, that we're so grateful at Arts for this acknowledgement by MODS Awards and the support of this award in continuing this work to put the voices and knowledge and experiences of people living with dementia and care partners front and center. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is wonderful. Um, so uh, now we are moving on to another section, which is the set up. I'm going to close this. I'm terrible with this. Um, this now is for supporting care partners. And this is to provide uh, training or education or support for care partners of people living with dementia. And if he's here, is Charles Brown here with us? If Charles isn't with us, we have a video from him. Do we not, Mary? Okay, we we'll need. just go, we'll go straight to that. Perfect. The Charles Award was for a documentary and we have the trailer for his documentary here today. So millions of Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. African Americans are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's disease. Research shows Alzheimer's is affecting African Americans at a much higher rate than white Americans. But African Americans are less likely to get an actual diagnosis of their condition, which means less time for treatment and planning. Experts in Wisconsin are taking a hard look at the systemic issues that exist in dementia patients. And as Sean Gallagher shows us, it's something that impacts people of color at a much higher rate. I really wish, I really wish that I could just have one more just heart to heart conversation with her where she knew me and knew who I was. And we could just talk like we used to. If I could just have one more. And when I got here in Georgia, I came in with full aspect. I could sing, I could play, go to church. I can't sing anymore. I can't play my guitar anymore. I've been sick a few times. By 2030, nearly 40% of individuals that will be diagnosed with dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, will be Black or Latino. This is how this disease is attacking our community and we're not talking about it. So uh, Charles or C. Nathaniel Brown, he has two, two names. Um, he has a program called Exposed Dementia, and we are very, very, very pleased that he is a recipient of an award. And we're sorry we're not here with us, uh, but congratulations. Um, and now I would like to introduce Roxana Delgado from UT Health San Antonio. She has a program called Caring for the Caregiver. Roxana. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we are so excited uh, for this award. And with me is my team. They're in the conference room, the Caring for the Caregiver team. So you're going to be able to see them online. Uh, we were extremely excited. So I do have a, a, a slide deck. Let me just bring it here. And um, so I can start. Uh, give me one second. Can you see it? I don't see anyone, but can someone said yes? We can, you can see these slides? No, we so can't see it, Dr. You can? Not yet. We can. Oh. Not yet. 
Oh, because I am not sharing my screen. And we practice this, right? <laughs> okay, let me let me try this again. What about now? Perfect. Yes. Wonderful. So um, my name is Dr. Roxana Delgado. I'm the director of Caring for the Caregiver Program. Um, that is that picture we wanted to add it there because that's how we felt when we heard about you um, and we saw your email. Um, that is actually one of our participants in the program. The Caring for the Caregiver did not happen by serendipity. Um, it is not something that we just occurred to happen in, 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 you know, in no time. So um, I first I want to talk a little bit about the two trailblazers who have been extremely influential in my life. And that is uh, Rosalind Carter and Senator Dole. Um, I came to the world of caregiving and my journey started 15 years ago when my husband was combat wounded in Iraq and he was medically evacuated. I started going to different medical facilities, experiencing the caregiver journey from the beginning all the way to now 15 years later. I am very fortunate that my husband regained all his independence. But of course, my love and my heart and my passion is to be able to be there for those caregivers who are coming behind so I can utilize all my skills and everything that I have um, along with my team to make sure that they have a better, that caregivers are supported, are recognized, that they have all the resources they need to be able to be strong. We know that caregivers are the backbone, the, the first line of response for long-term care. And we see that every day with our caregivers in our program. So um, I just wanted to highlight the tremendous work from Senator Dole with the Hitting Heroes Campaign, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, the Rosalind Carter Institute, and how much they have meant in my professional life. And I'm sure that many of your uh, personal and professional um, endeavors. So caregiving, um, oh, I don't know why it's not allowing me to go forward. Uh, let me see. There you go. So um, our mission is to truly improve the quality of life of caregivers in our community by providing resources, services. We also have a whole component of research. We want to uncover the heating, uh, uh, you know, evidence-based programming that we can to be able to equip them and make sure that they're strong and that they have the knowledge and that they have the capacity to be able to care for their loved ones. Um, this that didn't happen, um, like I said, by serendipity or any chance. We are following a lot of different guidelines. We're evidence-based. We're trying to make sure that we um, answer and address the call to action. One of one of the latest one being the Race Act, and we're touching on three of the uh, three of the five goals of the Race Act to make sure that we're equipped and we're prepared to care for our caregivers here in the San Antonio area. I should say I'm part of UT Health San Antonio. We are serving the Texas community, but because we do have hybrid uh, programming, we can serve caregivers all across the nation. But we have presence, uh, like physical presence here in the San Antonio area all the way to the border in the valley in Texas and all the way to El Paso and in North to Dallas. So one of our, like I mentioned, our program has three distinct pillars, uh, services. Through these services, we're able to deploy our, our, our team members, our nurses, everyone that is involved in our, in our program to be able to serve the uh, the caregiver community. We do that through workshops and, 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 and memory cafes and dementia friendly activities. So one of the latest that I wanted to highlight is the latest um, is the digital literacy. We noticed that our caregivers were missing appointments, our loved ones were missing appointments. We noticed that they were not as savvy to be able to do the telehealth. And we were able to bring uh, the digital literacy to train them on how they use their computers. And the beauty is that at the end of the workshop, it's a six weeks uh, cohort workshops, uh, they're able to take the computer home and, and, and have it with them. We're trying to reduce isolation, create social connectedness, create community between them. So they not only get to meet in person, but they also can meet through the, um, you know, through the uh, online. Uh, through the research, we're doing a lot of other things to be able to uncover, like I said, evidence-based programming, but we're focusing very, very much in the services and making sure that caregivers feel equipped. 
um, and that they have everything they need to be able to do the caregiving role. These are some of their core programs that we're running on a monthly basis. Um, one of them, the Memory Cafe, is uh, once quarterly, but everything else is constantly. This office is always busy because we run programs daily, like the reassurance calls, but some others are monthly. We're teaching caregivers how to utilize the different skill set, right? From gardening to culinary medicine, um, the essentials of caregiving is equipping them to know more how it is to, you know, how it is to be a caregiver of someone with dementia and how they can best uh, be prepared to care for that person, understanding from the lens of that uh, care recipient. With that, we bring the immersive dementia trainings where we actually have someone that walks that caregiver through the uh, immersive experience of how it is like and how does it feel um, the symptoms of dementia that is going to increase their empathy to that loved one for that loved one and we're able to bring that to their homes we don't stay in our offices we're constantly on the go because we want to make sure that we meet the caregivers where they're at so our team is constantly on the go we partner with a, a number of organizations from the Alzheimer's Association the Bear County um, and government uh, aging agencies, and we're constantly going out there, deploying our team and, and, and our volunteers to make sure that we meet the caregivers where they're at. We know there's a lot of isolation, so many times caregivers may not come to us, but guess what? We're going to find them and we're going to go to them, and we do exactly that. And um, we're very excited because each of them, then we have like a snowball uh, recruitment where caregivers go back to their communities. We activate, activate them and then they tell others. And that's where we're able to get the word out. Um, this is our amazing team. They're all in the conference room. Again, uh, we're very excited. Uh, the team is larger than this. This is our core team, but we do have a great team of nurses at the School of Nursing here at UT Health San Antonio. Uh, we also have the Wellness 360 Clinic, and we are able to deploy the mobile unit that goes into the community to be able to do screenings and education. And we have an amazing uh, community rallying around our caregiver community. All of us, one of the beauties is that in some way, right? Beauties and, and, and is that all of us have the lived experience. So everyone that you see here has either been a caregiver or needed a caregiver at some point in their life. So we're all in this in hearts and minds and everything. And I appreciate so much the time and being able to be here with you. Um, and anyway, we're very excited. Thank you so much. And if you're in the San Antonio area and would like to come and visit us, let us know. We always have coffee, water, pastries, cookies, uh, because we wanna make sure that we're welcoming of everyone that comes to this place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I've just uh, noticed um, that Charles has entered the building. Charles, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Um, Hello. Sorry, I'm, I'm coming in on a tail end. We're actually in preparation for the premiere of a play that we're doing this coming Saturday oh, wow. um, in Pittsburgh. So uh, we're in the midst of that. But thank you. I understand that you guys did see the trailer to Remember Me, Dementia in the African-American Community. Uh, that is the start of um, our program because it impacted my family specifically. And I realized that I didn't know much about anything around dementia. And so once I understood that there were so many things, I was like really dumb in this space. Um, I realized that also that if I didn't know, a lot of other people didn't know. And so I wanted to do something to begin to educate my family and then also educate uh, my community. And it grew from there to include uh, the book, Exposing Dementia, as well as the our nonprofit organization, which is Exposed Dementia. And those things are designed to utilize the media and the arts as a way to really get people in a place of understanding to remove the stigma of dementia um, and also to help us move further toward uh, a common understanding of who we are. And that means 
um, respecting everyone. And as Roxana was saying, like everyone is welcome because we are one. And uh, I like to say that, you know, you don't have to do it all, just do your part. And so we're just trying to do our part. We're not in competition with anybody. We're not trying to step on anybody's toes. We want to be the plug. We want to be the connector. So things that I can't do, you can do. Things that you can't do, I can do. And so that's how we're going to expose dementia if we're all doing our part. And so I'm I'm very proud of our team. I'm thankful for this opportunity. And it's just the beginning because we really just started in March. Uh, we screened the documentary for the first time in March. Since the documentary, we published the, the book. We started the organization, got the 501c3 in about 30 days. Um, so everything has been happening for a reason. And we're traveling around the country spreading this word. Um, and my hope is to make your jobs easier, to make your missions you know, easier. And so that's what we're planning to do, we're going to continue to do, and I look forward to working with all of you um, in the very near future. Thank you so very much. It's very nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now introduce um, Deborah Cherry and Lisa Harper from uh, Alzheimer's Los Angeles for their Telenova Recuerdos Perdidos Lost Memories. Thank, thank you, Marilyn, for having us here. And um, I want to thank Maud's Awards for selecting our program as one of this year's awardees. It's uh, an honor to be in such excellent company, really moving to watch all of the programs shown today. Um, we, we are honored to have our telenovelas called Recuerdos Perdidos, Lost Memories, um, gain this visibility. We're hoping that as a result of the visibility, more organizations will want to use them. Um, Alzheimer's Los Angeles is a community-based organization that was founded by family caregivers in back in 1981. Um, we seek to educate and support family caregivers and people living with the disease um, through support groups, care counseling, activity programs, um, advocacy to improve healthcare and a range of other services. We embrace our region's diversity and Los Angeles is tremendously diverse and we strive to be inclusive in all of the work that we do here in this community. Um, the telenovelas and there are three seasons of them um, were created to meet the needs of caregiving families in our local Latino community. Um, through a linguistically and culturally appropriate educational approach. Um, they're structured as four episode soap operas um, with seasons that tackle different issues in dementia. Um, and they are a popular form of entertainment in Latin America. And we are not the first to use them as a strategy for health education, though we are um, perhaps the first to use them in dementia health education. Um, in developing these telenovelas, we were lucky to have the consistent stewardship of Angela Landis, our director of video content and social media. She is the only staff person on board to have had a role, um, a key role in the development of all three seasons of the telenovela. She was the production companies and the producer's primary contact throughout production and her professionalism and expertise are evident throughout all seasons. But we're also really fortunate to have the remarkable leadership of, of our director of Latino services, Dr. Lisa Guyton Harper. Um, she provided the content for the newest season of the telenovela, season three, and she also guides our staff, our bilingual and bicultural education staff as they bring this educational tool into the community and help others around the country um, to adopt it. So let me turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Harper. Thank you, Jabra. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mary, Marilyn, Mary Grace, and um, lots of words. Um, so the script uh, was based from real life cases that are care counselors handle day in and day out. 
Uh, like Deborah mentioned, there are three seasons with four episodes each. Uh, we continued the story with the same bilingual, bicultural actors to follow um, a Mexican American family's journey as they cope with their grandmother, Abuelita Gloria, a uh, cognitive decline. So the series uh, is available in English and Spanish, each with subtitles. So the English version has Spanish subtitles and the Spanish version has English subtitles so that the, so multiple generations of a family can view uh, them together. Uh, content for each season follows the progression of the disease. So season one is uh, detection early stages. So Abuelita Gloria is starting to show some signs of forgetfulness. Uh, but not everyone at home is ready to accept this reality. And so the series follows the family as they overcome stigma and come together as a family for the sake of Abuelita Gloria's well-being. Season two, um, Abuelita Gloria has now progressed into the middle stages of the disease, and it's all about behavioral symptoms and caregiver stress and community support for the caregiver. And season three, which will be released this, which is being released this month, uh, uh, is all about late stages and of uh, the disease and end of life care. So the focus is on dispelling misconceptions about hospice care and providing families with the knowledge and resources to navigate the navigate the late stages of the disease. Evaluation of season one showed that viewers gained knowledge about dementia and its care, and that they expressed. Um, reduce stigma towards this condition. So 90% of participants stated that watching the novella helped them understand what Alzheimer's disease was. Um, 84% stated that watching the telenovela helped them understand the process of getting a diagnosis. And 97% stated they would recommend watching this telenovela to others. So uh, Alzheimer's LA has used the telenovela to educate um, with individual families uh, in groups. We have a facilitator guide that is available to lead the discussion and online. So I we have a little, um, a trailer, Mary Grace, if you could show that. Absolutely. Claudita. Is everything okay, Mama? No, no. I feel fine. This isn't normal. Jackie, don't start. Senora Gloria, you have Alzheimer's disease. Let what? me go! What's no! Going I'm, on? I don't know! I told you not to go to the doctor. Now they're scaring you. Mother is sick. This is not fake. This is not pretend. This is not her getting older. She is sick. Last time I came by, she acted as if she didn't know me. People change when they get old. Yeah, but they don't disappear. This is going to be a long journey. Thank you. And then we also have one slide that um, we could share. And so Alzheimer's Los Angeles is pleased to be able to make the Della Novellas and the facilitator guides available for use in other communities. So I have a slide that Mary Grace will, will pull up um, if you would like to use um, the facilitator guide, facilitator guide or, or view the series or download, please, that the information is there. Um, you just have to request um, permissions. And, and it's very easy. And I just want to acknowledge uh, that our bilingual educators at Alzheimer's LA who have presented the novella throughout the community and English and Spanish spreading the word, spreading awareness and educating about others about the dementia and caregiving. So without our awesome team, our bilingual educators, um, this, this would not have been possible. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm told we have all sorts of little surprises for you. I'm told that Arlita is about to hop off and we have her video. So Mary, are you going to play that right now? I am. Yes. 
It's just one minute. It's the trailer for her improv workshop, Improv for Caregivers. Um, Arlita, welcome back. Did you want to say anything in terms of intro for this? And you want to unmute yourself? You're muted. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is the workshop that I created based on me um, using empathy, storytelling, and improv to uh, caregivers. We are going to talk about caregiving. We are going to talk about laughing. I was a caregiver from my father, who was a person with Alzheimer's. What I use is improv comedy because I was tired of crying about it. That's what we do with improv. We say yes and, and we agree. The entire purpose of this is to save the caregiver. Because it's not a regular job. Sometimes a lot of our clients are frustrated. They know that they are sick and they don't really want help. And they're frustrated that you gotta take care of them. Something that you have to get creative with. When we do improv, we are coming up with things off the top of our head. We got it? Let's go. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Takeaways. So we want to relinquish our agenda. You create a plan. Uh, we improvise. We make our client look good. Uh, we storytell. We self-care. And we find our laughter. <laughs> it's a need, and you're filling a void, and you're helping people cope. I was like, OK, now this makes sense. Right? Thank you. Thank you. That's Thank me. you, Arlita. Thank, no Thank you for being here. Thank you. And we have two, one little interesting new category. For the first time this year, we did honorable mentions, two organizations that were just too interesting um, to um, pass by. And I would like to uh, invite these people to say a few words. Uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, from Cooley Dickinson Hospital, Pioneer Valley Memory Care Initiative, uh, Sharon Asher and Dr. Rebecca Starr. Hi, thank you. Um, we're thrilled to be here. And um, Dr. Starr had to hop off. She's with a patient, <clears throat> excuse me, but this, you know, the work that we do, we work with uh, to support caregivers, um, but just like the the amount of emotion that we've all probably felt during this meeting from Arlita and her joyfulness to thinking about the sorrow that happens, you know, it's such a journey. And I think everybody on this call is probably supporting folks in all kinds of different ways. And it's really, um, it really fills your heart, isn't it? Um, but what we do, um, and we're so thankful to have, to have been, you know, chosen for the honorable mention is um, we we're trying to combat the uh, social isolation that our folks that our caregivers feel. We're in Western Massachusetts. It's somewhat of a rural community. There's no public transportation. And as you know, sometimes people just stay home, right? It's easier. That's where all of our stuff is, where the person knows where they are. They're less confused. And then gradually the family gets really isolated. So we're pairing our families with um, somebody with a volunteer from the Village to Village Networks. So Village to Village um, is nation and I think worldwide um, now organization where people in their town, they they start their own little organization. And in our area, they're all called something neighbors, Northampton neighbors, Amherst neighbors, whatever the town's name is. And so we've partnered with all these neighborhoods and um, patients in our program who would like a volunteer, we pair with them and we do training for that volunteer. And then we do a lot of support to our volunteers along the way. We have monthly support groups and um, we're really finding that it, it's it's helping them in all kinds of ways. It's really helping that caregiver 
feel like they have a friend, um, someone they can talk to and expanding their world. So, um, so thank you anyway. I know we're running over. Thank you for the recognition. We really appreciate it. And just listening to this, I can't wait till I've written down all these websites and I'm sure you guys have too, and can't wait to delve into them all, but thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much. And last we have, um, from Dementia Action Alliance, um, a program from Gross Point, Michigan. And they wanted me to make sure that you know that even it's from Gross Point, Michigan, it's national in scope, working to speak to every person living with dementia. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Casey Acklin. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, to Maud's Awards. Um, it is my honor to accept this honorable mention on behalf of Dementia Action Alliance. Um, and I will be brief, but I do want to tell you a little bit about our resource, Pathways to Wellbeing, a manual of help, hope, and inspiration. This resource was born of a, a truly collective belief at Dementia Action Alliance that a diagnosis of dementia does not define the end, but rather it just marks a new chapter. And that new chapter can be lived with meaning and purpose and joy. And this manual, which was co-created by people living with dementia, by care partners, by professionals, serves as a resource um, to challenge the all too common narrative of hopelessness and decline. Instead, it encourages the empowerment of individuals to take control of their lives and offers powerful tools and strategies that support proactive living, resilience, and community. And you know, one of the wonderful things about this manual is that we all know that everyone's experience of dementia is unique and everyone's experience as a care partner is unique. And so rather than offer a one size fits all solution, Pathways to Wellbeing invites individuals living with dementia, care partners and professionals to ask the right questions that will help set them up for uh, developing individualized pathways to wellbeing, as the, as the uh, title suggests. And in just under two years, Pathways has reached thousands of people worldwide. And so um, I want to first encourage all of you to download your own free copy of Pathways to Wellbeing at daanow.org slash pathways. Uh, we want to make sure that this gets in everyone's hands. And I also want to express my, my genuine and immense gratitude to the entire DAA community but particular the people living with dementia who serve as DAA's expert advisors and whose voices and lived experiences not only shaped this work, but live throughout it. Their courage, insight, and determination has uh, really reminded me continuously every day that dementia absolutely does not erase personhood. There's so much life to live. And thank you to Mods Awards again for this incredible recognition, and we're so appreciative. Um, so on behalf of DAA, thank you all. And together, I know we will continue to build a world in which every person living with dementia and every care partner can truly thrive. I hope you join me now in applause to every single one of these fabulous people. Thank you. It is so inspiring to be among this ever-growing group of people who are building better lives for people who are living with dementia and their care partners, who are, in the words of my friends at the I'm Still Here Foundation, are working to transform the public perception of living with dementia from fear and stigma to joy and hope. It is so wonderful to be among you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.